reaction on the biological system, biological and ecological system. If I may suggest, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I can, I think we can open the camera. We are not so many, so we can uh, actually see and know each other in face. Um, working probably in the same field, it's good to to, to also uh, see each other. So uh, the first uh, talk uh, of this parallel session uh, will be by, given by Mado Aslani, Aslani, sorry for the pronunciation, I hope it's correct. And uh, he's going to talk about the universal route to pattern formation in multicellular system. So Malware, you have 12 minutes. So we are starting four minutes later. You have 12 minutes and then we have three minutes of uh, question and answer. Can, you can go. Okay, thank you very much, Samir. Thank you for the introduction also. So let me share the screen here. Uh -huh. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, okay, so as you can see, uh, my talk will be about uh, pattern formation. In particular, it will be uh, aimed to uh, Turing pattern formation. Um, this was a joint work uh, with Tao Kaleti from University of Namur, uh, Duccio Fanelli from University of Florence, and uh, Philip Maini from University of Oxford. Well, usually when I talk about uh, pattern formation, uh, actually is, uh, uh, it was my, my main uh, theme of, of research during my PhD, uh, I, I start with this slide. Because here you can see this, these beautiful patterns uh, observed in nature, these um, uh, wonderful colorful uh, stripes, uh, uh, spots, and so on. And uh, um, indeed there is a mathematical ex explanation why we have this kind of order, this spatial order distributed in, in the surface, uh, skin, coat of animals. And it was due to the genius of Alan Turing that we have a theory today and he initiated actually uh, uh, somehow a mathematical biology in this direction at least. And uh, it can be explained uh, by writing down a set of reaction diffusion equations um, uh, that uh, the one that you can see here for the evolution of two biochemicals. One is called the activator, the other one is called the inhibitor. And um, the biochemicals, so the molecules of these two biochemicals can interact with each other when they are in contact at the same uh, microscopic, let's say, uh, spatial patch uh, through these functions F and G. And they are also allowed to diffuse between, between cells, of course, because we are, uh, let's say, considering that our domain in some sense will be a biological one, so it will be constituted by cells. And there is a mechanism known like uh, Turing instability that uh, explains the emergence of these patterns. And indeed, starting by, uh, by a uniform uh, uh, distributed uh, um, um, equilibrium uh, state, which initially is stable for both uh, these uh, biochemicals, it is possible to reach some conditions. And then I will explain in, in more details. Uh, and it is possible to reach these conditions. And then we have an instability. And then the pattern is initially shaped according to the Fourier uh, eigenfunctions. And then is stabilized in some nonlinear regime due to the nonlinear terms. So uh, going through a, a linear stability analysis of this uh, set of this equation here, and following, uh, uh, and this is the mechanism, explain the Turing mechanism. So he started from a ring of cells. And the main factor that I highlighted here is that uh, in his model, he need to increase um, quite uh, in a considerable, let's say way, the uh, ratio of the diffusion constants between the inhibitor in red and in blue of the activator. And indeed the activator is the one that activates the growth of both chemicals and the inhibitor uh, plays the op uh, opposite role that of inhibiting this growth. And diffusing faster, it is possible to see this kind of pattern. So this is a schematic uh, presentation here, but it's possible to see, to, 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 to see this kind of, of pattern. And indeed, uh, mathematically, now I skipped, let's say, all the mathematics, but we reach a condition. So I'm putting it here because I need it later on. But it is a condition called the dispersion relation. It's a function of k. k is a wave number. Uh, during the linear stability uh, is derived uh, this, uh, uh, this parameter k. And as a function of k, we plot the eigenvalues of our, of our uh, spatially extended system, but now linearized, right? And of course, if it exists a finite window where these uh, uh, eigenvalues, here I'm plotting on only the real part, 
uh, is positive, of course, my system is unstable, and then I expect uh, Turing pattern to develop. Uh, I put it a, a note here that indeed this condition is quite a strict one because it is uh, not realistic, and then I will show you later on why. But before I do that, uh, it is mandatory to show you how indeed through the uh, Turing uh, model, original model, it is possible to, to see the emergence from a slightly perturbation of an equilibrium state, the emergence of spots or stripes, depending on the set of parameters that we choose. In this case, we took a model for the reaction part, uh, uh, the Brussels later, the famous Brussels later model. Now, um, the main point and, and, and the inspiration for this work is that uh, the Turing original model is somehow obsolete. So, there are a lot of papers, even daily, uh, uh, based on the Turing model. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the main point, that of the high diffusion rate uh, difference of, of, of rates for, for, for both species, is something that we don't observe in reality. In reality, we have that biochemicals will diffuse in some fluid, for instance, almost with the same, with the same pace. So it is impossible to see this difference. And indeed, the first experiment was done by the group of the Kepper uh, in a laboratory. So it was like almost 40 years after Turing uh, developed his model, when they put, uh, in a quite genius way, actually, they put uh, a gel in order to slow down the activators. So this way, they could observe this uh, uh, periodic patterns that you can see here. And indeed, from the biological, let's say, or biological and philosophical point of view, uh, we have only two solutions, so, uh, two, two choices. So, or the systems really know the set of parameters, for instance, for my Brasilator model B and C, I have that here is a set of parameters when I can have the Turing path information, or they exactly know that this is a set of parameters and they uh, place them, themselves there, and we have this, uh, this uh, path information behavior, or as we, let's say, think that at a random, they choose some point in this space and this region should be quite large in order with some probability uh, to have uh, such behavior of the mergers of patterns. And indeed, we took the uh, Turing model and we add some uh, physical uh, constraints that are uh, based on observations. The first of all is the direction in the movement. For instance, you can think of chemotaxis that occurs a lot in biology or a Osmosis, all this stuff. So it, it is the same ring with some direction now in the movement of the both biochemicals. Now the biochemicals have, have almost uh, the same rate of diffusion. This is uh, important. Uh, at the same time, we consider, and for this reason, it is multicellular. Our system should be discrete, of course, with a number of cells that we can uh, change, we can tune. And also, this is another factor, another uh, parameter that we can tune, but this was possible even in the Turing model, is uh, uh, the uh, magnitude, keeping the same ratio, but the magnitude of the diffusion uh, constants. Indeed, the fact that it uh, should be uh, discrete and with uh, some, let's say, uh, considerable number of, of, of size of of, of cells is inspired by embryogenesis because embryogenesis uh, is a, a process of pattern formation, of course, of morphogenesis and that uh, occurs uh, only after the, the zygotic cells uh, go up to a given number. So it doesn't occur immediately, right? So after a, a while, uh, the morphogenesis will occur at the embryo. And indeed, now it can be translated with some techniques that we have borrowed actually from uh, network science. So here now we uh, take our set of reaction diffusion equations. It is an ODE. We use a network Laplacian that you can see here instead. So it is a discretized version of the ring, but it is more powerful. And now the dispersion relation will be a function of the Laplacian eigenvalues, as you can see here, and it is discretized in this way. So what we need is to have at least one eigenvalue that will stay in this unstable region here. And indeed, we can, in a complex domain, because being directed now, our Laplacian, so our network, will have a spectrum that is complex, as you can see here. And for a ring, so the ring has a, a Laplacian, which is a, a circulatory matrix, the eigenvalues will stay uh, on this ring. So it is, it is funny, this, uh, this, uh, this aspect, but we will stay on a ring, as you can see here, the empty uh, stars here. And what we need is to push these empty stars in this green region. The green region is the region of instability. Now, when we have exactly the same diffusion rate, this region is zero, it doesn't exist. But it will be quite thin. Now here I exaggerated quite a lot, but it will be quite thin indeed 
if I have a slightly difference between these uh, two uh, diffusion uh, parameters. The problem is that if I will follow the Turing uh, classical uh, version of, of, of this model, it will be this blue region here. Now, uh, taking these further considerations, what we have is that we can add the number, even this region is quite thin, right? We can add a number of eigenvalues here, increasing the size of my uh, spatial domain of my ring, right? And at the same time, being positioned in this way, what I only need is to increase the magnitude of the diffusion rate for both uh, constants, keeping the ratio the same. So the ratio the same, it means I'm not changing the green region and I can always in any situation, this can be proved, actually it is based in this uh, geometric illustration, we can always have the instability. And here, without exaggerating, for instance, uh, I put another region based in our model. And in this case, uh, we can see that uh, is a most, let's say, a Turing model with some further considerations that the region it is quite enlarged and uh, justifies the universality, let's say, of Turing patterns. And here you can see some, uh, some patterns, uh, stationary patterns, uh, for instance, like the Turing original patterns, or even traveling waves. Traveling waves are due to the fact that we have a, a, a direct diffusion. And uh, yes, and this is all. And here you can find our paper for some more mathematical details. I skipped quite a lot of them. And also uh, our, our results were, uh, let's say, covered by some uh, media uh, press recently in, in uh, ERA, ERA Alert, which is a, 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 a section of science journal uh, regarding news and so on. So uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have, uh, actually you finished quite in time. So we have uh, oh. four minutes of questions. So any questions from uh, the audience? Okay, in the meanwhile, I will, uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, when you asymmetrize the diffusion. Yes. Okay, so in this, so this is the, 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 the main uh, fundamental contribution, right? So you, you basically give a direction of the, of the diffusion. So my question is, I think, uh, from previous studies that the, 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 the boundary conditions are very important. Yes. In the sense that uh, if you close or not close uh, exactly. this chain, uh, you can have a very different behavior. So exactly. Uh, exactly. what is, uh, what, what? Uh, and, and this is actually something that I skipped. Actually, I remember that I had uh, like three or four elements and I was trying to remind which one that I skipped. Uh, I skipped it actually because we took exactly the same ring of, 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 of Turing and then we, we added these other constraints. Well, the periodic boundary conditions are quite important indeed in order, uh, not only for our model, but uh, even in, in, in our scenarios. So uh, why they are, uh, let's say, uh, justified in this sense? So because one can say, okay, it is not uh, a ring, it is something else. We don't have periodic boundary condition, the, your model doesn't work. And that's true actually. But the point is if we, uh, for instance, here I have one di dimension, right? What I need, for instance, if I take a cylinder, in the book of, of, of Jim Murray, but even in his papers, the one uh, uh, that uh, wrote the famous book about mathematical biology, uh, he writes quite a lot about this periodic boundary condition. For instance, he says that if I take the body of, of a leopard, like the one that I showed you before, these periodic boundary conditions are quite justified in one direction because it can be considered like a cylinder. Actually, a cylinder doesn't have closed boundary conditions, in, not in all the dimensions at least. What I need here, and this is based in our previous studies, uh, there is a scientific report paper about um, pattern formation, Turing patterns in Cartesian networks, because indeed a cylinder can be considered like a, a, a Cartesian product of, of two networks, a ring and just a line, right? So what I need is at least in one dimension to have periodic boundary conditions, in order for the for this thing to, to work. But again, if we think about embryo, embryogenesis is again like a globular uh, shape. If we think about uh, other scenarios, for instance, uh, pattern formation for uh, uh, tubular uh, tissue, uh, like is the case of thin, uh, uh, intestine, we have wrinkles in the intestine, uh, patterns again in this case, quite important. And even in this case, we have again, at least in one dimension, periodic boundary conditions. Uh, so, uh, of course, this is quite important, but it is quite feasible because this is uh, the, the reality. Okay, thank you very much. 
Are there any other quick questions? Yes, I have okay. a question. If, okay, please. Interesting talk. So, um, so about the difference between the diffusion coefficients of the two components. So uh, uh, my comment is just that this problem is not entirely impossible if you have one component that's uh, in the cytoplasm and the other component that's in the membrane, then they could intrinsically have very different uh, diffusion coefficient. Mm -hmm. So do you know any example uh, where you know that's the situation? So they're basically using um, components from different uh, parts of the cell to make it work. Uh, actually, this is quite uh, interesting because people now are thinking in terms of multi-layer. Uh, there is even a recent paper in uh, the Journal of uh, Theoretical Biology or Mathematical Biology, I don't remember now, uh, that people do exactly this. Uh, so if you want, it is an observation of the Decaper model. We have two different layers, the gel, where we have the activators, it can be a membrane or whatever. And inside the cell, for instance, it can be the, the, the other part. Uh, people are, are, are working on, on that and think that this is indeed the scenario. In our case, what we think, uh, at least, is that you don't have this kind of different layers, right? Um, you have uh, the same, uh, the same uh, domain. Uh, it is also based a little bit in biochemistry, uh, where people do this kind of experiments, like the Decaper one in biochemistry. Uh, they have the same domain, the same fluid. In that case, they try to introduce like at least two layers in order to have this difference. But a lot of patterns, for instance, in the, even in the Brassilator model, they are observed these patterns of oscillations and so on, but not Turing patterns because the diffusion constants are the same. So it, uh, let's say, relaxed quite a lot, not having these multi layers in a different way, it relaxed uh, the, the, the conditions or the instability. Thanks. Okay, so I think we, we should move on to the next speaker. That I am, I, I am my, myself. Okay, so I'm sharing myself. So uh, let me share the screen. Okay, I hope you see. Yes, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to present this work that uh, we have uh, published um, um, little, a few months ago with my collaborators, Leonardo Pacciani, he's just finished the PhD in our group, and Amos Maritan, and uh, that is uh, co-leading the, the lab uh, here in Padova, and Andrea Giometto, that is at Harvard, and uh, he mainly takes care of the experimental part of this project, which I, which I will all, only mention. So let me first frame the problem. So the problem in ecology is well known, uh, is uh, we observe a really amazing diversity of species, and not only that, but we observe such a diversity in uh, environment with uh, just a few resources. You can think of plankton. We, we have very few biotic and abiotic resources, and yet there are thousands of different species. We don't know actually uh, the, the, the exact numbers. But you can also do this experiment uh, in lab, so in control lab experiment. You take a environmental sample, you extract DNA, you look at the bacteria existing in this uh, in this environmental sample, and then you cultivate such uh, such bacteria you, through experiment of dilution and growth. And actually, again, uh, you now control the, actually the, the, the resources, and yet with the one or two resources, you can have 20, 30 species that coexist together. And so this is uh, somehow unexpected from uh, classical ecological community theory, because uh, having few niches that here are represented by resources, this should result with few coexisting species. And in the, in the, in the bottom uh, plot here, you can, you can think about an experiment, uh, two species in the same medium, E and C. But actually, if uh, the, the, the species A is uh, better in uh, extracting resources from the medium, uh, in the long time, A will uh, overcome C, and it will be the only uh, species that uh, uh, exists. So, uh, this is known as competition exclusion principle, principle and uh, is still, uh, let's say, an open question in ecology. The classical way to study such problem, the problem of coexistence of species and, resource, and resources, is, made, uh, is done through the MacArthur model. It's a consumer resource model. So here are the two equations, and is the abundance of the species uh, sigma, and we may have uh, M species. 
while C is the abundance of resources, and we can think to have uh, uh, P resources. And so, of course, as you can see here, the, the species growth by using the resources and die because of that rate. And it, uh, the species uses the resources through uh, the, the alpha sigma i that represent uh, the metabolic uh, strategies, uh, so the, the, meta the metabolic uh, uh, energy that the species uh, uh, sigma uses to uh, extract from resources i. Of course, uh, the resource concentration increases because of a supply rate, uh, typically, and then uh, there is a degradation and the consumption from the other species. And uh, it's easy to see if you solve this equation of stationarity that you cannot have coexistence of uh, more species than resources. So in this uh, simple model, it's clear that you cannot have more species than, uh, than resources that coexist. And again, this is known as a, co a competitive inclusion principle. So one point uh, uh, that uh, is, uh, mm, okay, so one way to visualize uh, uh, the, the solution for the consumer resource model uh, is uh, geometrical. So there is a geometrical interpretation. And first of all, uh, um, uh, highlight a very important uh, contribution of uh, POSFI and collaborators uh, was that of course we need to impose a kind of budget uh, of energy budget that a given species may use. So there is no infinite energy that a species can use. And such metabolic budget in this framework was, uh, was, uh, was constrained in a hard, in a hard, with a hard constraint. And uh, using this constraint, one can uh, uh, find that there is a geometrical condition for species to exist. So here on the left, we have uh, three species, uh, sorry, four species and three resources. So each resource is, is represented by one vertex of the triangle of the simplex actually. And the star is the supply rate of the, of the, of the, of the, of the resources. So uh, you can prove that uh, basically all species can coexist. So thanks to the energy budget, there is a condition for species to coexist even if there are more species than resources. And the condition is that the supply rate must be inside the convex hull of all the metabolic strategies. So here the metabolic strategies are represented by this colored point. The supply rate is outside. In this case, species are going to extinct. Only up to three species, typically less, will coexist. In this case, because of the supply rate is inside the convex hull, all species coexist. But there is a problem with that. It is as soon as you perturb or you, pour, or you put a soft bound on this constraint, actually the competition exclusion is recovered. So again, this is somehow a very fine tuning of the model so that uh, to have a coexistence of species. So uh, this is a first problem. Another problem is that uh, typically in this uh, consumer resource model, uh, metabolic strategies have, uh, co are considered fixed in time. So they are constant. But actually, it's very well known since in the 1949, a very famous ex experiment by Monod, that uh, the strategies, the metabolic strategies of, me of bacteria change in time. So they are not fixed. And this is uh, uh, basically proven using uh, the so-called deoxygen shift experiment, where you give uh, to a given species uh, two resources. One is the most favored one, and the other one is the least, uh, the least favored. And you can see that actually uh, metabolic strategies of the species change. In fact, you find a uh, first uh, regime of the growth of the growth that uh, where when the species is using the most favorable resources, and then a second regime when is which the metabolic strategies that is uh, uh, slower, where the species is using the second uh, the, the least favorable the least favorable resources. So you can see here in this curve that the growth rate is not a simple exponential, but there is this shift. Uh, that uh, is a signature of the fact that uh, metabolic strategies change in time. And this is the contribution of our work. We have uh, basically introduced the possibility for metabolic strategies to change in time, so to adapt. And how, what is the dynamics? Well, the dynamics is very natural. That is, we want to maximize the growth rate of the species. So, the resource, the strategy of each species is to change their metabolic strategy so that the growth rate of that species is maximized. So we are within a very classical equivolutionary framework uh, where metabolic strategy tends to maximize the fitness of the species. 
Okay, now I'm skip the, 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 some technical details, but of course, again, we need to introduce a, a bound for the metabolic strategies, but we do this in a very so, in a soft way. So we just introduce this soft bound and uh, we implement such a soft bound into the, directly into the equation for the, for the metabolic strategies, obtaining a final equation for the dynamics of metabolic strategies. So this is just imposing the maximization of the fitness and a soft constraint uh, on the total energy budget of each species. Okay, so the first result is that we using this, uh, we can see a self-organization of the strategies towards um, maximization of growth rates uh, allow for uh, having the, uh, for uh, describing the deoxy shift. So here you can see in the, in the red line, uh, this is uh, the models in the, in, the, in the cross line are uh, uh, dots from the experiment. So we are able to reproduce basically the, 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 the dynamics of the oxy shift. But this is not only qualitatively reproduction. Actually, we did experiments and we were able to actually show that this model can really uh, be used to describe quantitatively the uh, population density in a, a real experiment of uh, uh, of, um, of uh, bacteria with the two uh, resources. Uh, that is not the case for fixed strategies. And uh, finally, also, we show that uh, uh, when multiple species and resources are considering, the model violates naturally the competition exclusion. Why? Because uh, the strategies self-organize so to include the supply vector within the convex hull. So differently from before, that we, were, we had extinction, now we have a natural way to self-organize the strategy so to, that all the species coexist. And this is very interesting also when we uh, perturb the system. So here, imagine that you have a, two, a supply vector that change in time from the red, uh, from the stars to the diamond, stars and diamond periodically. So in this case, uh, with the uh, fixed um, strategies, uh, you would, have, you would uh, observe extinction. But in our case, again, we can see that uh, strategies uh, dynamically uh, self-adapt in order to follow the switch of the environment. So here we see that we are a really genuine adaptive uh, dynamics of, of the strategies. And uh, finally, uh, we can uh, uh, found, of course, that uh, depending on the velocity of the, of the adaptation, we can have uh, um, less or more species that, co to, that coexist. Uh, and in particular, we also show that we can reproduce a typical rank abundance plot that are observed uh, in experiment. Um, so this is a, 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 this is a, a very uh, succinct uh, presentation of, of our work. You can uh, find the full reference uh, here. Um, in particular, I want to point out that uh, we, we also um, uh, have proposed a um, biological uh, and um, bottom-up uh, models for, uh, for such uh, adaptive strategies that is use a co a constrained protein allocation. So this is just, was just accepted in the Ismail journal. So with that, I want to thank you and I'm open for questions. Okay, if someone have questions. So maybe if I make a, most a comment rather than a question yes. eventually. Uh, so um, it was very nice uh, by the way. So I'm really fascinated by this uh, ecological modeling. I followed uh, several of, of your papers and the NAMOS. Um, regarding this later result uh, with this movie that uh, was optimizing, let's, let's, let's say, the localization in, the, in that domain of resources in order to include also the star point, it looks to me a little bit like um, somehow like a um, uh, non-cooperative game theory modeling in this sense that maybe the, the species uh, is somehow uh, play between them, or or it is far, let's say, from from comparison this way. No, let's say I mean uh, uh, this is actually so. The ingredient is very simple in the sense that what we did was to optimize, uh, so having a dynamics, uh, so to optimize the species fitness 
In this okay. sense, it's a classic eco-evolutionary model. So here there are no strategies in the sense that the bacteria okay. cannot choose to, to, I don't know, cheat or cooperate, but they just want to maximize their, their fitness, okay? And in this case, you can see that uh, you, you can, actually there is emergent basically cooperative behavior in a sense, mm -hmm. in the sense mm -hmm. that uh, this adaptation allow for coexistence. At the same time, it's very important to note that uh, the, the, the velocity of, the adap of adaptation is very important parameters. That is to say, if there is species that have a faster adaptation velocity to other species, then you can have actually uh, competition. And so you can actually observe extinction in the ecosystem. So this is not a model where every time, everywhere, all species coexist. Okay. Depending on the, on the adaptation velocity, depending on, on the kind of perturbation, you may have that only a few species exist or, and, or, or more. So this is depend on, on, the, on the specific setting of the, of the system. Okay, and how much, let's say, if we would explore a set of parameters, so the main parameter, how much possible, let's say, this, uh, this occurrence is, let's say, more or less? So it depends. So basically, this is the, so basically the, 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 the velocity, um, this is not quantitatively different, depends only on the time scale of extinction. So the largest is the adaptation velocity. You have a, basically a, a scaling for, for, uh, for extinction. Uh, that is uh, very, very, very slow, okay? Uh, and, and if you take the thermodynamic limit in a sense, it will be infinity. But uh, in general, so this is just change somehow the, the slope of, 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 of velocity, but there is no, I mean, just adding this ingredient of, the, of adaptation, you really change uh, the behavior of, of time to extinction. So it completely changes depending independently of, of, the, of the, basically the value of the parameter. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, there are other yes. questions. If not, we can move to the next speaker. Okay, so. Um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> okay, perfect. So you can share your screen. So we have Jin Chen. Okay. Uh, I've actually pre recorded. Uh, ah, so it's pre recorded, okay. Yeah, so um, I mean, it's, it's going to sound a little impersonal. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Thank you. OK, uh, let's see if this works. Im importantly, you need to share the sound when you, sh when you share the screen. On the bottom left, also share sound, computer sound. Otherwise, we are not hearing well. Oh, uh, how do I, how do so I set exit, exit the share screen? to okay. be sure and do it again. Okay. So when you click now share screen, mm -hmm. look on the bottom left, you, you see like a, a click and like share sound, computer sound, something like that. Uh, I don't see a button. I on just the have bottom a... left, it's very small, on the bottom left. Bottom left, uh, there's mute, stop video, security. No, no, part... first click, no, no, first click share screen. Oh, okay. I see, oh, I see. Now, Okay. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Okay. Please let me know if this works. Okay, now we see. Now we see. Uh, it's not big. I don't think it has started yet. Oh, come on. Computer is slow. There we go. Hello everyone, this is Jin Chen from Virginia Tech. Today I'm going to tell you how mathematical modeling can tell us about an interesting aspect of Oops. We have probably all heard of the term circadian rhythm. It is the around 24-hour rhythms in our bodily function and physiology. For example, we typically stay awake during the day and feel sleepy at night, and this rhythm is generated by a molecular clock that exists in every single cell. The clock proteins uh, form a Oops. Negative feedbacks, which generates this 24 hour oscillation. And this oscillation can control the rhythmic expression of hundreds and thousands of genes in a cell. And ultimately, the rhythmic gene expression in all these cells adds up to the rhythms in our body. So far, we have a pretty good understanding of how the clock proteins gain their rhythmicity. However, how 
do they control uh, the rhythmic expression of other genes remain rather poorly understood. Because a number of proteins in the molecular clock are transcription factors, so so far the study of uh, rhythmic gene expression has mainly focused on rhythmic transcription. Naively, this sounds sufficient, right? According to the central dogma, uh, rhythmic transcription would lead to rhythmic mRNA, and rhythmic mRNA would lead to a rhythmic protein. However, the true story is much more complicated. Actually, gene expression itself is much more complicated. Both transcription and translation consist of many complicated subprocesses. So this cartoon is actually a simplified summary of uh, these subprocesses. And in fact, uh, rhythmic transcription factor only constitute part of this one little tag. And there are experimental evidence showing rhythmic controls in all these other uh, subprocesses. So today, I'm going to focus on the polyatels of these mRNAs, and there are studies showing that uh, their lengths are rhythmic controlled as well. To understand why we care about the tail of an mRNA, let's look at what the tail does in gene expression. So the polyatel is a ubiquitous feature of mRNAs, except for histone mRNAs. All the other mRNAs in eukaryotic cells carry such a tail. So the mRNA first acquires this tail in the nucleus during transcription, and then after the mRNA enters cytoplasma, uh, its uh, polyatel can be dynamically shortened or lengthened. And this polyatel plays important functions uh, in regulating mRNA regu uh, degradation and translation. So in many genes, its uh, uh, mRNA polyatel uh, exhibits this 24-hour rhythmicity as well. So for example, uh, my collaborator, Dr. Kojima, found over 200 genes uh, that exhibit such rhythmicity in mouse liver. And furthermore, she found that uh, this rhythmicity is strongly correlated with the rhythmicity in the corresponding proteins, which suggests the importance of rhythmic regulation uh, in mRNA polyatel. Because of its importance, here we're interested in understanding how the polyatel is rhythmically regulated using mathematical modeling. We build a simplistic model based on the key aspects of the life cycle of the polyatel. Here, for simplicity, we're not going to track uh, the exact length of the polyatel, but we're going to split the mRNAs into a subpopulation with a long polyatel and another subpopulation with short polyatel. So because newly transcribed mRNAs uh, come with long tails, typically more than 200 nucleotides long, so in the model, transcription generates long-tailed mRNA, and then in the cytoplasm, uh, the uh, polyatel can be deinulated and polyannulated. And so uh, in the model, this becomes the interconversion of the two uh, subpopulations uh, via the two processes. And finally, mRNA degradation typically requires the polyatel to be first shortened to just a few nucleotides. So in the model, we assume that only short-tailed mRNAs can be degraded. So this allows us to write two ordinal differential equations to describe the dynamics of the long-tailed and short-tailed mRNAs. Uh, under the influence of these four processes. And uh, to describe the rhythmic controls, here all the rate terms kappa uh, are written as cosine functions of time. Then we can plug into the model the mean rate, peak phase, and relative amplitude of the four processes, and then predict the mean level, peak phase, and relative amplitude of the L and S. And particularly, we're interested in these three quantities, namely the L over S ratio, which quantifies the polyatel length, L plus S, which is the total mRNA abundance, and L, which is the long-tailed mRNA abundance, uh, which is a rough quantifier for mRNA translatably because uh, polyatel controls translation. So now the problem is that we don't know the parameters. And in fact, uh, the parameters are likely gene-specific and very different for different genes. So we turn to ask a generic question uh, over a global parameter space. And this question is, which rhythmic regulator is most important for the rhythmicity in the poly A and mRNA? So to answer this question, uh, we're going to perform 
global parameter sensitivity analysis, which will tell us uh, how do each of the output quantities here uh, rely on each of the input parameters here. And the method we use is called the Sobel indices. So the Sobel indices is a variance-based sensitivity analysis. Because we're analyzing the model over the global parameter space, so the output for the model will have variance. So for example, for a particular output Y, its variance can be decomposed into the contribution from single parameters, and then the variance contributed by interaction between two parameters, variance contributed by interaction among three parameters, and so on and so forth. And the Sobel indices are just defined as the fraction of these decomposed terms out of the total variance in Y. Particularly, the symbol Sobel index for Y with respect to XI is the fraction of the variance contributed by XI alone. And the total Sobel index for Y with respect to XI is the fraction of the sum of all the variance terms above that contains XI. And so as you can see, the larger the Sobel index is, uh, the more sensitive the output Y is to uh, the parameter XI. Now let's look at the results. Let's first examine the rhythmicity in Alice ratio, which quantifies the polyatal length. So the Sobel indices tell us that the phase of Alice ratio is most strongly dependent on the phase of deinlation, followed by the phase of polyinlation, while transcription and degradation has nearly no contribution. And the same thing happens to the amplitude of the Alice ratio. This amplitude is most strongly dependent on the amplitude of the deinlation, followed by the amplitude of polyinlation, while transcription degradation has no uh, contribution. So both results consistently tell us that deinlation is the strongest contributor to the rhythmicity in the polyatal length. The next one we're going to look at L plus S, the total mRNA abundance. So the phase of L plus S are most strongly dependent on the phase of transcription and the phase of degradation, but the phase of deinlation and polyation has some moderate contribution as well. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to show the amplitude results anymore. Next, we're interested in the rhythmicity in L, the rough quantifier for mRNA translatability. So the Sobel indices results show that the phase of L is most strongly dependent on the phase of deinlation followed by the phase of polyinlation, the same pattern as the LS ratio. So, so far, our model tells us that deinlation is the strongest contributor to the rhythmicity in both polyatal length and mRNA translatability. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you some further investigation, which will show that deinlation is not only strong, but also literally a dominant contributor to these rhythmic controls. So this further investigation is motivated by the observed rhythmic patterns in the expression of the protein factors uh, that mediate the deinlation and polyinlation. So it's not surprising that these factors are rhythmically expressed such that they can rhythmically control deinlation and polyination processes. However, what's interesting is that five deinlation factors are found to be rhythmically expressed and they peak at three distinct windows, but only one polyinlation factor is found to be rhythmically expressed. So we wonder why does deinlation factors have such a diverse uh, rhythmic pattern uh, whereas polyinlation factors only has one peak. To understand how the phase distribution of these processes may shape the phase distribution of the output, we did a number of in silico experiments. So in the first experiment, we had the phases of all four processes to be evenly distributed around the clock, and in this case, the phases of all three output quantities are evenly distributed around the clock. This is like no-brainer, and it's just a control experiment. And in the next four experiments, in each of them, we set the phases of one of the processes to peak in three narrow windows and keep the phases of the other three processes to be evenly distributed. And then we can see that in experiment four, where the deinlation peaks in three windows, we can see that L is racial and L peaks in three windows as well. And this doesn't happen to any of the other processes. So there's a strong clustering effect 
on the LS uh, and L rhythmicity uh, that's imposed by the deinlation phase. And if we plug in the experimentally observed phase distribution, the deinlation and pollination coming from the previous slides, and also uh, do phase distribution of uh, transcription that comes from another paper, we can still see uh, a strong clustering effect of the LS ratio and L into three distinct time windows. So this, um, here I want to emphasize that, uh, except for the phases, the relative amplitudes and the mean rates of all four processes are randomly chosen as well. So this means that the uh, clustering effect imposed by deinlation is so strong and so robust that it happens regardless uh, of rhythmicity in other processes. So this clustering effect is essentially a synchronization effect. It tells us that the genes controlled by the same deinlation factor could have synchronized rhythms in their poly A tail length and mRNA translatability. This is a very interesting finding and may have important biological roles. For the sake of time, I cannot discuss it, but if you're interested, please check out a paper for an extended discussion on this. So to summarize, our model shows that deinlation is the dominant contributor to the rhythmicity in the poly A length and a rough quantifier for mRNA translatability, and is so strong that it can potentially synchronize these rhythmicities. And here is my group. Xiao Yao is the graduate student who did the modeling work. Shihou Kojima is our experimental collaborator whose previous study motivated this modeling study. And Shi Chen told us about the survey indices method. To check out our paper, please scan this barcode and here are funding resources. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, so if not, thank you again. And uh, we can move to the next speaker. Um, next speaker is uh, Guillermo Janet Feliu. Probably I misspelled. I'm sorry. And is no, it's about perfect. Em emergence of traveling waves from a synthetic oscill oscillatory gene network. You, you, are you going to do it live? Yeah, I'm gonna do it like. Uh, Perfect. So you have 12 minutes. You can start. Do you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Hello, everyone. My name is Guillermo Yanez from Universidad Católica de Chile, and I work with Tim Raj and Andrea Rasio, and I'm going to present the main project of my PhD thesis, which studies the emergence of traveling waves from a synthetic oscillatory gene network in growing cell colonies. Patterns are everywhere in nature as repetitive shapes in space, even, even showing similarities at different scales. Uh, for example, we can see similar optical effects when studying a bacterial colony or a nebula, which are various orders of magnitude apart in, in size, or how similar spiral patterns can be found in different organisms, or how dots and spots are distributed in, in different animals. These patterns can be generated as, uh, by chemical, physical, or genetic means, among others, and are of great interest for researchers from different disciplines, such as biologists, engineers, or astronomers. For genetic expression, there are control mechanisms of the process that goes from DNA to protein synthesis and the most relevant controls considered in this work are the transcriptional controls, where a protein called a transcription factor induces or represses the expression of a certain gene. In the figure in A, we see a constitutive gene, that is a gene that is not regulated by a transcription factor, and in B, a negatively regulated gene. The repression occurs when a transcription factor, which is the repressor, binds to the operator site in the transcription unit, blocking the RNA polymerase to perform transcription. These control mechanisms can form transcriptional networks made up of genes that interact with each other 
And that is that, that a gene can produce a protein that acts as a repressor in some of the other genes in the network. Uh, in the diagram, genes are seen as nodes and the arrow is the repression representation. Here in this work, we focus on the repressilator, which is a gene network that encodes a ring oscillatory topology consisting of three repressors, where repressor one inhibits repressor two, repressor two inhibits repressor three, and repressor three inhibits repressor one. Below, you can see the oscillatory behavior of the system, uh, of this genetic system at the single cell scale. Uh, for this experiment, the authors assemble three fluorescent reporters along with the three repressors in the same plasmid. Each of them uh, is related with one repressor's concentration. Then we perform experiments where the genetic construct containing these three repressors and the three reporters was transformed into E. coli and then grew in microcolonies. This heavy fluorescence imaging uh, of the final point of the growing colonies reveals the formation of ring patterns of uh, gene expression. And given the fact that these pictures were taken as the final point of growth, uh, and in order to, to study the system dynamics and to investigate the emergence of collective behavior, we also perform time lapses of the microcolony growth. These uh, 24 hour time lapses experiments of the growing colonies uh, surprisingly show traveling waves of gene expression from the border of the colony towards the, the center. Here you can see it again. There is a ring form in the border and then the wave travels towards the center. So uh, in order to describe and predict the formation of these traveling waves, we have developed a, a theory that could allow uh, us and researchers to characterize these discovered patterns and then further enabling researchers to design and build uh, their traveling waves genetic constructs as desired. Uh, first, we show in silico how mechanical constraints generate characteristic patterns of growth rate rate heterogeneities in growing cell colonies. And uh, from a simple bacterial colony growth simulation, we derive an expression for the pattern of growth rate across the whole colony, which describes the, the growth rate as exponentially decaying from center to border and the front velocity as con constant. Then this pattern of growth rate will fill our model uh, as protein dilution as I will show you in the next slide. Next, we uh, next to the characterization of the of the pattern of growth, we develop a model based on the processes of transcription and translation for the repressilator. And in the model, the index i represents the current gene, and the index j represents the gene that produces the protein that represses gene i. Uh, this model considers explicitly the effect of growth rate uh, on protein dilution in the equation of uh, protein production. Uh, and then considering the steady state for mRNA and, the, and rescaling, we reduced the, our model to just one equation for each repressor dynamics. This simple a one-dimensional model uh, predicts that coupling the repressilator dynamics to this pattern of growth rate via protein dilution generates traveling waves of gene expression. And these results are shown in chymographs, which are time projections that represent the spatial dynamics of a one-dimensional system evolving over time. Each point in the, in the chymograph represents the state of the system at a given time in the y axis in the x axis and its position with a color in the y axis the color uh, represents the radially averaged repressor protein concentration that is in red in green and in blue at its each uh, position at each time point uh, in a 
when protein degradation is zero, we observe horizontal stripes that show static, static rings uh, while the, the colony is growing. Then in B, when dilution due to grow is zero, we observe vertical stripes that represent in-phase homogeneous oscillations while the colony is growing. And finally in C, when protein degradation and dilution due to growth are greater than, than zero, we see these diagonal stripes representing the, the traveling waves, which are moving rings uh, of the repressor expression going from the border towards the center. And uh, as shown in C, the lambda corresponds to the wavelength uh, of these traveling waves, and V sub P corresponds to the wave speed. So with these results, uh, we confirm our theoretical prediction of traveling waves patterns emerging from the repressilator circuit when coupled to growth rate patterns. We also show that the dynamics of these uh, spatiotemporal patterns are determined by two parameters, the protein degradation and the maximum rates, uh, expression rates of the repressor. We derive simple relations between these parameters and the key characteristics of the of the traveling waves patterns. And first, wave speed is determined by protein degradation, and second, wavelength is uh, determined by maximum gene expression rate. Then, to test if these uh, predictions hold in in holding in constrained growing microcolonies of cells, we used our individual based biophysical model of bacterial cell growth and division, which is an overdump system of expanding growths. In this simulation, we grew colonies from a single cell up to 60,000 cells, tracking each cell's motion and protein expression levels according to the equation for protein production. In this case, the growth rate, the growth rate term which was here, uh, is not considered since dilution was computed by the biophysical model. And these results show, as predicted by the one-dimensional model, the, the formation of symmetrical traveling waves rings uh, relative to a center of the colony. The, the analytical predictions from our one-dimensional analytical model we're in close quantitative agreement with the numerical simulation of the growing cell colonies when comparing the wave speed and the wavelength predictions of each of the models. And thus we propose that mechanical constraints generate growth rate heterogeneities that could induce traveling waves of gene expression from, from, the, oscillator, from the oscillator genetic network in, in cell colonies and you can tune wave speed and wavelength by changing protein degradation and maximum gene expression rate respectively. So in summary, our, our theory demonstrates that mechanical constraints generate growth heterogeneities that induce traveling waves of gene expression from the repressilator genetic circuit in cell colonies. Uh, our results show that wave speed is determined by protein degradation and that the wavelength is determined by maximum gene expression rate. Um, we found a quantitative agreement between the analytical predictions of the one dimensional model and the experiments with the numerical simulations. And finally, in order to support our theory, we show experimental results that generate traveling waves, uh, but that are qualitatively different to our analytical predictions. I would like to thank the members of Raj Lab and the Developmental Mechanics Project for their support. And um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, so are there questions? Yeah, I had a question actually. Yes, please. Uh, so it was, I mean, a little bit strange uh, to me. You had a model, if I'm not wrong, of uh, three repressors, so they are all inhibiting the, the system or, or, I mean, who is activating somehow? Because usually the models for emergence should be a competition between an activator, inhibitors, activators, inhibitors, excitatory inhibitors. So 
this is a bit strange because I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. Okay, so this system consists of uh, this, these three repressors um, where each of them represses, represses the other. So repressor one represses uh, the repressor two, two, three, and three, one. And with this topology, you obtain these dynamics for the for each of the repressors concentration, as you can see in this video. At each so time, see. We are more. So the things that we don't understand is what leads to the growth part, because it's if if there is all a repression, how can uh, you have this uh, feed positive uh, excitatory, let's say, growth of the? Is there any like uh, injection of uh, mass? In the system, why? Why? No, no. Everything got... Ah, you mean in the for the growth rate pattern? No, no. I mean in that part that you show what leads to the growth. This plot represents the the concentration of each of the repressors, right? Mm -hmm. So this is at the single. This is at the single cell level. And this is a okay. microfluidic experiment, which is being fed by nutrients all the time. But the positive growth of the green uh, or the red or the or the violet in the in the positive Same. growth is due from from which uh, from what? Uh, for example, for the green, if the green uh, increases its concentration, it's because the repressor three. It's being inhibited by repressor two. Okay, but so there so, is a, a self excitation for repressor one. And for repressor two and for repressor three. Ah, okay. So in all the three, there are self excitation. Right. So, it, for example, in this point, okay. you have no concentration of the red and the and the blue, and then the red starts uh, increasing ah, okay. its concentration. Uh, okay, okay. Given the decreasing the decrease of the concentration of repressor one, which represents right. repressor two. So there two. is a self excitation so, in each of the genes. Self excitation in each of the gene also. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if <laughs> that's uh, if calling it like that. But yes, okay. so, I'm not familiar with that. In the term. absence, uh, in the absence of uh, interaction, uh, the the gene expression grows. Let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. 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 And so I have related questions. If you show the analytical model in the equation. Okay. So in this video, uh, no, the, uh, yeah. Okay. It's also this one. So in the video, the you show like this, uh, this, uh, this bacteria reproducing, right? So you have like a multiplication of uh, bacteria. So this is a classic growth of bacteria. And, this, and and the growth rate uh, depends on the on the radius. So you have different heterogeneous growth rate depending on, on where you are. But then in exactly. the equation, in the, in the next slide, there is a minus in front of mu. Yeah, the, so the I don't model. The yeah. Because uh, you have for mRNA and for protein, you have degradation rates which are degrading the, the proteins in time. But the novel, the novel in, this, in our model, the novelty in our model, is that we consider the growth rate degrading, the, I, mean, I mean, diluting the protein concentration as the cells grow and they grow faster than the production of proteins, the volume increases, so the concentration uh, in the whole volume of the bacteria decreases. That's the ah, okay. that's that's the coupling of the growth rate of this uh, growth rate pattern into the dynamics model ah, okay. of the production of the repressors. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, if not, I want to thank you again, all the speakers. And uh, in uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so, there will be a session with uh, the journal publisher. So you are all invited, we are all invited to join. And thank you again, and maybe we can 
see around, I don't know, virtually around, uh, there is like also space. If you want to take a virtual cafe, you can go there. Okay, thank you very much to everybody.